Hello everyone, um, I am back for yet another video and this one is going to be about geospatial indexes. Um, if you're wondering what a geospatial index is, let me uh, give you an example of something. Let's imagine that we're on a website, I won't really talk about which ones, but you see something that tells you that they're, um, you know, 10 5 mile radius that are interested in you. Well, um, the only way they can actually do that uh, in a decently efficient way is using something like a geospatial index. So we're going to go ahead and talk about how those work and break it down for you. Alrighty, geospatial indexes, what are they? Well, basically in a ton of modern day applications, there's some sort of need to be able to do the following access pattern. We want to take one given point, so maybe like a coordinate, like a latitude and a longitude, and find all of the other points in the database of perhaps a certain type that are within a certain distance of it, probably by radius. So examples of this happening are Uber um, in terms of you know finding a nearby driver, Yelp in terms of finding nearby restaurants, and Tinder in terms of finding nearby potential dating partners. Um, as we know, um, querying in a database can be done with an index, and that's kind of there to speed up both you know normal queries and range queries over one given column. However, um, with geolocation data, we have to use something a little bit different, or at least make a modification to the data itself in order to use indexes the same way as before. This is where geospatial indexes come in, and I'll explain those now. So what's the problem with coordinate data? Why can't we just use a typical index? Well, coordinates are typically expressed by a latitude-longitude tuple. So as you can see, if we imagine latitude and longitude on this Cartesian plane, where latitude and longitude are each kind of one axis of it, we have all of these points. Okay, So now let's imagine that we want to find all of the points within some distance of that yellow highlighted point. So that would be those two points in the circle there. Well, basically, what can we do? Imagine we had a traditional database, and we have these two columns for each point, latitude and longitude. Well, I guess if we had an index on either latitude or longitude, what we could do is just go ahead and basically say, OK, uh, say the distance was five miles. Um, let's find all the points with a latitude you know, within like the five mile equivalent of that. And then you know, once we have all those points, we can go ahead and filter them out. Well, the problem is in the real world, there's a ton of points that are going to be within just you know, a certain latitude value, but not within also the right longitude value. So only having an index on one of these two fields is very inefficient because it means that we find all these points, but then we still have to go ahead and filter a ton of other points down. And you know that could be millions, even perhaps uh, tens of millions of points that we would basically just have to invalidate by using some sort of um, you know, like Cartesian equation for finding the distance between those two points. And it would be super inefficient. It's basically just a full table scan. So obviously that's not going to work. So what can we do that would actually take advantage of an index and allow us to quickly find all the points within a certain distance of one point? Um, obviously we're going to have to look for a better solution here. So what we do instead is called geohashing. So geohashing um, is kind of like a pretty simple overview of it. This isn't exactly how geohashing works, but it's kind of the way that I'm going to summarize it. And then, you know, if you do any research in the future, hopefully that will make more sense to you. But basically, the gist of geohashing is this. Imagine a map of the Earth, which I'll just, you know, let's imagine it was a 2D plane right here, again, split into that longitude and lat latitude. You take every single section, divide them in some sort of way, hopefully relatively evenly, or maybe by population or something like that, and mark each section with a letter or a number. So just a character for now, and we'll just call that the geohash of the section. So as you can see, at, imagine this is what um, the entire world looks like, the whole map. So you know we might have Asia in the you know the K and L section, uh, the U.S. might be in the G and H section because that's going to be at least in the maps that I look on on the western part. Um, so the point is though that we have this initial divide of the map, but obviously this doesn't really describe uh, areas particularly precisely. It just you know creates this map into huge chunks of you know massive geography. So what we can actually do is imagine I have this portion up here with uh, the label letter A. What I'm going to do is divide A into a bunch of subcategories. So imagine we zoomed in on A now. The view would actually look like this. So we take A, which is a rectangle, and we divide it into all these subregions. And so the point of each subregion is that every single subregion is its parent region concatenated with one more character. 
and each of the subregions are unique in terms of their strength. So this is going to, you know, continue downwards to a really, really small size of, you know, region. So I obviously have a depth of two here, but, you know, I could have a depth of three, I could have a depth of four, and every single time you just go ahead and take that parent node and then split it into a bunch of mini chunks, which again, you just add an additional unique character for each of those sub chunks. So let's think about what that actually does. Basically, as the length of the geohash increases, the size of the bounding box of the geohash decreases. So you can see on this chart to the right, we have all of these geohash lengths and the corresponding size of the bounding box, or at least an approximation of the size of the bounding box. So basically now what we have are we have all these big regions and then all these subregions of the bigger regions where all the subregions are the bigger region concatenated with some string. Why does this work really well? Well, it all kind of pertains to the fact that when you take all of that, um, all of the geohashes like in total and you order them, it means that similar points are going to be right next to one another in that ordering. So let's actually think about that. So this is kind of going to be the entire process of geospatial indexing right here. And it's kind of based off that whole geohash idea. So if you recall, both B trees and LSM trees with the SS tables allow us to execute really fast range queries based on an index field. So imagine here that the index field is going to actually be a geohash. It means that geohashes that are next to each other are probably going to be very close to one another in proximity in the actual world if they're next to one another in the index. So let's say now that we have a given point and we want to actually go ahead and find the points near it in our geospatial index. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our point, which is probably a lat long coordinate, and convert it to a geohash, and there are services to do this for us. Then what we want to go ahead and do is actually figure out the size of the geohash depth that encapsulates the distance from the point that we want. So say, you know, we want to find um, all points within a few miles, you know, we could go ahead here and say, oh, maybe depth 5 looks good for us because, you know, it's 4.9 kilometers squared probably most of the points that we want are going to be within the same geohash of depth 5. But we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in a second more so. So then we're going to take our geohash of the point that we're looking at and truncate it to the proper depth because we're going to go ahead and assume basically that all of the points that we're looking for are going to be within that bigger geohash that is going to encapsulate all of the nearby points with the appropriate size. And then finally, once we have that um, bigger depth, we can go ahead and use our index and execute a range query to go ahead and quickly find all of the points inside of the bigger geohash. And then once we get all of those points, we probably have to go ahead and actually, you know, filter a few of them because obviously the size of the bounding box isn't perfect, but it just, you know, greatly limits the field of points that we have to look at in order to see which ones to uh, go ahead and check. But I'm actually going to provide an example of this because I know that was all kind of abstract. Okay, so imagine we want to find all points that are less than a kilometer from this random latitude and longitude. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is get the geohash of that. I'm assuming that, you know, there's just some API you can call to do that. And uh, that's not actually the real geohash of the point. I just made it up, but whatever. So first of all, imagine we get this geohash. Then what we're going to do is get a proper bounding box. So we're going to go ahead and say, okay, well, the geohash of, you know, length 5 has a size 4.9 kilometers squared. So if that's the case, all of the points that we want, which are you know within a kilometer, are probably going to be in the corresponding length five geohash. So all we're going to do is now truncate our original geohash to length five, um, and look at all points in 91 vz6 because that's truncated to length five. So now take a look at the diagram on the right. Basically, we have our original point, which was 91 vz62q. Um, we have its bounding geohash, which is 91VZ62. Basically, you just take away the Q. And then if you take away the 2 there, we have 91VZ6, which encapsulates all of that. Um, keep in mind that, like I said, even though we might just be looking at 91VZ6 here, in reality, if, 90, if you know, the point we were looking at was really close to the border of 91VZ6, then maybe we'd have to look at a couple more neighboring nearby bounding boxes in order to find all of the points. So probably, you know, maybe like nine in total because you would want to look at the top one, the top left, the left, the bottom left, the bottom, bottom right, right, and top right. But anyway, for, for now, let's just simplify it and say we're going to be looking at the one with the proper depth, so that's going to be 91 VZ6. 
we know now that because of how geohashes work, that basically any single point inside of a geohash, so any single subregion inside of a region, is going to have a lexic uh, lexicographically greater ordering than it, right? So every single point inside of 91VZ6 is going to be greater than 91VZ6 when all of those strings are sorted. And we also know that, imagine there was another box uh, on the same level as 91VZ6, so like think of them as siblings, called 91VZ7. We know that the second a point is, you know, greater to or equal than 91VZ7, it's no longer in the 91VZ6 subbox. So what this means is that we can go ahead and execute a range query on our index saying, give us all the points that lie between 91VZ6 and 91VZ7. So this is a super quick thing. If we are using SS tables, those are going to be sorted, and we can go ahead and perform a binary search really easily and get the bounds of that range query. And then the same goes for a B tree, which also allows you to perform that read in logarithmic time. As a result, though, since obviously these boxes aren't like a perfectly tailored size for us, we may have to filter down the results of the actual range query a little bit. But just compared to an index on either the latitude or the longitude, this is hugely efficient and much, much faster. OK, so let's talk about geospatial indexes in a distributed setting. Obviously, in reality, there's probably going to be a ton of data points. If you're Tinder or you're Uber, you have a ton of cars, a ton of users, and uh, you know a ton of people looking for potential dates. And as a result, you probably can't store all of those on one machine. So obviously, these are going to have to be partitioned somehow. The good thing is that geospatial indexes are actually really easy to partition. Because you can just basically go ahead and take any region and say, OK, plop this region and all of its subregions accordingly onto one node. And then, you know, so say that's going to be like the New York region. And then I'll go ahead and say, okay, take the, you know, the box that contains Pennsylvania and all of the sub-Pennsylvania nodes and put that on another region. So basically this, this kind of like tree structure of having all these sub-regions makes it so that it's super easy to go ahead and partition a geospatial index and put um, the data for one area on a different node than another area, which is great. And then obviously you can do stuff like replication and all of that. OK, in practice, how do geospatial indexes actually look? What type of hardware are they used on? Well, it seems like for ride-sharing companies like Lyft, Lyft tends to use something like Redis for geospatial indexes, because they actually have a service that builds it into Redis. And um, that means that they're probably going to be kept in memory and really fast, so that you can constantly query um, the service in order to see your distance from the driver, see the driver's current location, et cetera, et cetera, which is great. And then in addition, Uber kind of has created their own type of geospatial index, which is very similar to geohashing, but as opposed to doing it with um, rectangular boxes, it actually uses hexagons. Uh, the reason they do this is so that, you know, if you say, uh, from this given point, I want to find all points within a certain radius, um, the kind of a hexagon with a bunch of surrounding hexagons is a lot better for resembling a circle. And that way, you can kind of more easily check other hexagon cells to see relevant points. So it's, I guess it's just a little bit more intuitive. Um, I'll put a link in the description if you guys want to read more about that. Um, what about geospatial indexes in terms of indexing shapes or polygons? Um, sometimes there are services that kind of want to be able to you know, store a bunch of polygon data um, and you know, put those on a map. And that's kind of how a lot of maps are built out. But actually speaking, they are unlikely to use geohashes. Um, geohashes are mainly optimized for just kind of indexing points and being able to find a bunch of points that are near one another. But if you actually want to store shapes themselves, you're better off using this more complex structure called an R tree. Um, there are similarities to geohashes, but at the end of the day, it looks like in R trees, you can actually have overlapping boxes, which is not possible in geohashing. Uh, maybe I'll make a video about that in the future, but for now, it's a pretty complex topic. And it's not necessarily something that I think we need to know. OK, so in conclusion, geospatial indexing is hugely important for any uh, application that's going to hold a ton of geographic data, as opposed to just using a typical 2D coordinate in order to make queries. It hashes these to one single value, which it can then make really efficient range queries on. Um, overall, I hope this is pretty helpful, because there are a bunch of systems design questions that ask you to build services um, that involve ride sharing or online localized dating or even just review services but in a localized manner. 
And as a result of that, it's probably pretty important that you know how geohashes work so that you can actually go ahead and talk about them. Um, as always, I'll put more data or more information in the description of the video so that you guys can read more about it. Um, but yeah, I hope this one was useful and uh, I look forward to continuing to talk about new content.